So, good morning and uh, welcome to uh, the first day of uh, uh, this year's uh, VMKI. Uh, we have uh, an exciting program consisting of uh, two invited keynote talks uh, and uh, 30 talks uh, of contributed papers over today and tomorrow. Uh, and uh, we'll give you some more information about the numbers and the selection process uh, behind uh, uh, kind of creating this uh, exciting program uh, uh, tomorrow at uh, the closing session. Uh, and also at uh, the end of the closing session, we will announce uh, uh, the best paper award. So uh, please attend to hear uh, uh, which uh, paper won the best paper award. Um, so without uh, further ado, uh, it is my uh, pleasure to welcome our first invited speaker uh, for this year's VMKI, uh, David Harel, uh, who is... Um, uh, <coughs> Uh, who is a professor of computer science uh, uh, at uh, the Weizmann uh, Institute uh, of, um, of, of Sciences uh, and uh, a president of the Israel Academy, Academy of uh, Sciences and, uh, and Humanities. Uh, he has been at uh, the Weizmann Institute uh, since uh, 1980, where he holds uh, the William Sussman Professorial Chair. Uh, and he was the Dean of the Faculty of uh, Mathematics and Computer Science for seven years. Uh, he completed his PhD at uh, uh, MIT in, at, in uh, uh, 1978. Uh, in uh, 1984, he found uh, a software company, iLogix, uh, which later on uh, was acquired uh, uh, by um, IBM uh, uh, in uh, 2008. Uh, he's a, a fellow of uh, the ACM, IEEE, uh, EATCS, uh, and uh, he has a, uh, an honorary doctorate degree from a, a long, long list of, uh, uh, of universities. Uh, he's uh, very well known for his work on uh, program logics, uh, computability theory, database theory, uh, software engineering, and modeling biological systems. <laughs> I'll be sure. Right. <laughs> it's, and so just the important points. Uh, so in 1980s, he invented uh, the graphical language uh, of uh, state charts for specifying and programming uh, reactive systems, which then has been uh, adopted as part of the uh, UML uh, uh, standard. Uh, he has published uh, uh, also a large number of uh, kind of uh, expository uh, accounts of computer science for the general audience, including uh, award-winning books uh, on uh, algorithmics, uh, uh, the spirit of uh, uh, computing and uh, computers limited uh, what uh, they really can't uh, do. Uh, and um, so uh, today he will uh, uh, tell us uh, about uh, two papers on uh, human uh, interaction with uh, AI, where AI is not abstract interpretation. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so one little known fact is that I was born in London and actually grew up in Leeds until the age of seven, which is where my somewhat corrupted uh, um, accent comes from. <clears throat> also, um, it's very difficult today to come uh, anywhere from Israel and just do business as usual. So I have one slide on what's going on in Israel. It's not politics. It's not even politically incorrect. Just three facts. The last of which is something that I really believe in. So, great. So October 7. 223, the cruelest, most unbelievable attack by Hamas. 1,400 murdered, scores raped and mutilated, thousands wounded, and around 240 people torn from their homes and friends and kidnapped. Uh, from October 8, 2023, a retaliation war against Hamas in Gaza with unusually high casualties on both sides. And I can only express uh, the deepest uh, sorrow uh, for that. But this is no way to bring back the remaining 136 kidnapped. And I don't know how many of you know me personally, but uh, for many, many years I've been a um, uh, very vocal um, uh, oppo opposition to our government on many, many things. And now I think this war has to stop immediately. The hostages have to be returned and then a two-state two solution has to be uh, negotiated. So that's my... Uh, and I apologize if this isn't appropriate for this conference, but that's the way it is. Two of my grandsons, by the way, were uh, fighting in Gaza just until 
two weeks ago. And exactly 50 years before that, I was fighting in the 1973 war. Uh, so it's a difficult part of the world to, to live in. So I'm going to try to cram into less than an hour two papers, uh, both of which were recently um, accepted for publication. This should appear in the CACM, I hope, soon, with uh, my colleague Asaf Maron. Uh, those who know Moshe Vardi, so Moshe Vardi, Asaf Maon, and I were undergraduates together in the early 1970s, uh, and we, we, of course, were, were in touch. Asaf Maon has been working with me and my group for the last uh, 15 or so years. So the title is Human or Machine Issue, Turing-Inspired Reflections on an Everyday Matter. So this is a strange paper, no theorems, <coughs> no experiments, no results, just some thoughts ruminations, and a lot of questions, um, which makes it quite difficult to give a reasonable talk on this paper, which is really more philosophical than scientific, which of course was, reminds me of the story about René Descartes, who when he was a young child, he said to his mother, when I grow up I want to be a mathematician because then all I'll need is paper pencil and a waste paper basket for the errors and the false uh, paths. And then a year later he said, no, I'm going to be a philosopher because I will not need the waste paper basket. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope this is uh, not what you, you come to think of this paper. So the question that, uh, that we pose in this paper uh, is how will we human beings interact with machine agents that try to mimic humans in everyday interactions? Uh, you know, here are some examples of things that we're thinking about, autonomous vehicles, chatbots, and, and so on. Um, this is not another Turing test paper, not at all. Uh, we're interested in how an agent's human or machine identity affects the interaction that's taking place anyway. The HRM question itself, human or machine, are we interacting now, am I talking to a bot or to a human being, is not central. We do touch upon it in this paper, but that's not the central issue. We are not interested in defining intelligence or testing if a machine is intelligent, which is essentially what the Turing test is trying to do. And we're not interested in whether machines can carry out challenging tasks or mimic humans well. We're simply asking questions about the interaction in everyday uh, matters. We focus on these everyday interactions, not on a controlled rigid lab setup. So we're not sitting down in an office with two computers, with two rooms, and one is a human, one is a machine. Nothing like that. You lift up the telephone, you call your healthcare provider, you're driving along the highway, and there's a car next to you. It might be an autonomous vehicle, it might not. This is an everyday interaction. And we limit ourselves to interactions on the situation and subject matter at hand. So if you're driving and there's an autonomous vehicle, you don't want to say, hey, when was Kennedy assassinated? You know, to test whether there's a human being there. That's not the issue. Or if you're talking to your healthcare provider to ask about things that have nothing to do with healthcare interactions. So you, you can't really stray to other topics. We're concentrating on what we are doing already and the next few years we will do a lot of all the time. And we're interested in patterns of effects across many interactions. I'm not interested whether if you talk to your healthcare provider, you will answer that. We're talking about things in general. And we we do touch upon the HRM question, are we talking to a human or a machine? But we do not propose a method for figuring out whether you're talking to a human or a machine. Although, from many of the issues, uh, you think about it, uh, you, know, you will be able to discern, uh, in many cases, uh, the answer to this question, but that is not our main point. And, and again, remember, you're not, don't, don't uh, expect results and tables and numbers. I'm just going to be talking. And then I'll move on to the second paper. So, the main questions that we ask in this paper, are, here are some of them. What are the inherent differences between the behavior of a machine agent that we are interacting with and a human agent? And are these, in fact, easily discernible? Do we act differently when we interact with machines? And if we do, how do we act differently and why do we act differently? You know, maybe we think that the machine is stupid, so we will talk to it you know, very, I have a very small dog, she's nine years old, but when I walk her on the street, people think she's a little baby and puppy, they try to, you know, it's, it's not the case. So don't, you know, so do we, we, we will, will we be talking to uh, uh, two machines differently for many, many reasons? And here's an interesting one. 
should we insist or should regulators insist that the identity of whom we're talking to be given freely or be easily resolvable? Uh, I've talked to a lot of people. Many people say, of course, I don't want to lift up the telephone without knowing that that's a bot over there. I want the bot to say, hello, this is your friendly uh, digital uh, whatever, and, and so on. But it's not, it's not quite clear. Uh, there are cases where you don't really want to know. Um, and, but if, if so, yes, then how uh, and, uh, and, and why do you want to do that? And when should you say up front or not? And do we always want to know? And so these are some of the questions and some of the issues. And here are some thoughts. As I said, this paper has issues and thoughts and some of the thoughts that, that come, came to our mind. Of course, the paper itself, we made an effort to write it up in a readable way. It's not a bunch of bullets uh, like here. So first of all, at present and in general, machines are still incapable of fully disguising themselves as human. So in many, many cases, it is really possible to figure out whether this is a human or a machine. But we feel this will change dramatically because of pervasive automation, which is boosted significantly by large language models, of course, and by proliferation of interactions, everyday interactions that will sprout up as these things get more common, that mask the agent's identity. So, for example, text only, voice only, the inability to determine whether a device is autonomous or not, for example, a, a car with darkened windows, um, so, so you don't really know. But even when the agent appears to be a human or appears to be a machine, it might be in mixed mode, partly control, partially controlled by a machine and part, partially by human beings. So, you know, we might have autonomous vehicles that are driven autonomously, but there's someone sitting in some central control place and making sure that things are done a certain way and maybe making some, uh, uh, some changes to the, to the behavior uh, of the system. When you call uh, a doctor, a human, a human uh, physician, uh, and it's human, he or she is human, uh, very often they themselves are sitting in front of a, a machine and are getting the answers from a machine. So that's kind of hybrid mode, although it doesn't sound like it. The doctor is not just talking about what he or she thinks, but he's telling you what the machine is, uh, is supplying them. So when we interact with an agent, a machine or a, or a human being, should we care about or respond differently to the following kinds of things? There, there are many, here, here are a few. Emotions. So, you know, we all feel that machines do not have emotions, but do we care about that? If we're talking to a human being, should we care, should we act differently? The agent's <laughs> adaptivity. So humans, in general, can adapt more easily to different situations. Maybe machines not. Maybe in the future, yes. Uh, agents who are, which are machines are usually uh, are thought of as being rigid and det deterministic. And should we... Uh, and so the question here is not whether this is the case, but should we respond differently? Should we get upset by the fact that an agent is rigid, uh, even though we feel or we think or we even know that it's a machine? Um, language skills and eloquence. Uh, and, you know, we all know about the uh, relatively recent uh, uh, area of prompt engineering for large language models. Um, you know, how about that? I mean, do, do we get upset by the fact that the vocabulary is maybe uh, not as good as we would expect, or maybe it's better than we would expect, uh, and so on? And how will interactions with machines in general differ from interactions with humans? Will we use different language? And so these are the interesting issues about our own behavior. I mean, will I, just like people on the street, they, they treat my nine-year-old dog as though it's a puppy of two months old. Sometimes this happens with human beings, by the way. You know, uh, uh, teenagers tend to take two-year-old babies and lift them up and think that they're, you know, one week old. Should we use, will, will we, not should, will we be using different languages and different styles in our interactions with, um, uh, with machines versus with human beings? Should we, will we, have increased or decreased trust or patience uh, with the, the agent we're talking to, with stupidity or inconsistency and, and so on. Now, if I do not know, and it's not revealed to me whether this is a human or a machine, will we make efforts to figure it out? I mean, think of yourselves. So you're listening to this, you know, is this a machine, is it not a machine? Sometimes this distracts from your interaction. Should we be doing this? Will we be doing this? 
Um, and sometimes we say, aha, this is a machine, let me play along with the way machines, the way I think machines think. And if we do know the identity, whether it's a human or a machine, should this identity be, not, not if we know, but it's, if it's revealed, should it be revealed once at the beginning, that, you know, this is your friendly chat box from your healthcare provider, or should it kind of keep, keep showing, like, you know, when you're recording uh, a Zoom conference and it keeps on this little red light that says, I'm recording, I'm recording, I'm recording. Should this be continuously revealed? So let's go to vehicles for a moment. Should an autonomous vehicle be clearly marked as an autonomous vehicle? You might say, who cares if it drives well, you know, and we trust it, then it's just like, you know, you driving uh, to, to my right or to, or to my left. But think about this, in interactions with an autonomous vehicle, there are some possibilities. Will we be inclined to mimic its driving? Because we know it's been designed and tested extensively and we have this trust in the fact that it drives right. So hmm, if it's driving at this speed and it's not overtaking, maybe I shouldn't do. Or sometimes quite the opposite, especially in the Middle East. You know, I'm the world's best driver. No machine can do better than me. And therefore, I'll do things which are quite different from this autonomous vehicle, even if we know that it's an autonomous vehicle. And a lot of these questions and, and thoughts, they kind of sit upon differences that human beings believe exist between, between humans uh, and machines. A lot of these things here you've probably thought of and you know, so I'm, I'm kind of taking the, the chance of being a, a superfluous here, but I think it's still important to say this. So we believe, many of us believe that machines are pre-programmed, but human beings have free will. And I don't want to argue about this. I, I, I still uh, have, don't have my waste paper basket like Descartes. So if you philosophize about this, you know, you can, you can talk for a long time about machines have free will, can they fall in love, do they have consciousness and, and so on. But in, in general, in an everyday interaction, you kind of have the feeling that the machine does not have the ability to say, hmm, maybe I should do this and not do that, and then, and then do something different. We feel, we think that humans have emotions and feel compassion and pain and love and so on whereas machines do not. Um, we have this feeling that a human, no matter how broad and how intelligent, a human is typically limited in its experience to particular domains. You know, I'm good at one and a half things, I'm a little bit good at three other things, and that's more or less my, uh, my, my span of, uh, of uh, possibilities. Whereas in principle, machine knowledge can span numerous areas. And, you know, we know this, you know, even the healthcare provider, you know, who knows what kind of machine is behind it. And if we s happen to say when it was Kennedy assassinated, you know, maybe it will know. Um, machines, this is our beliefs again, machines may demonstrate more efficient and more consistent collaboration than humans. And so I think we believe that when there will be, if and when there will be, uh, swarms of uh, autonomous vehicles, the coordination between the autonomous vehicles will be better than the coordination and collaboration between human-driven uh, vehicles. Again, all these things might not be quite right, but these are the kinds of things that go through our heads when we are having these interactions. And of course, uh, we all believe that humans make a lot more mistakes than machines, although you know, the conferences in this building, uh, a lot of them have to do with verification. And we also believe that human behavior is more random and arbitrary and is thus less predictable than that of machines and that the machine is something that's predictable given particular situations, given particular things that I'm talking to it about, then their uh, response is more predictable. So what do I want to say in, in closing this part of the talk about the future of this issue, the human or machine issue. Again, it's not a Turing test, it's not intelligent, it's not setting up a way to figure this out. It's just how will these interactions um, um, you know, blossom and develop o over the next few years. So maybe ultimately we will become indifferent to the HRM identity. Maybe we, we won't care, you know, we get so used to it that well, sometimes it's a machine, sometimes it's a human, the machines are doing better and better and better, so we wouldn't care less. Perhaps developers will not build agents that mimic humans at all, maybe because we don't care about the difference, uh, and maybe instead concentrate efforts and money on taking advantage of the machine's abilities and avoid the costs involved in trying to disguise the, the, the machine uh, as, 
as a, as a human being. Um, there's still a lot of stuff that we don't understand at all, which has to do with nonverbal interactions. It's a whole different ball game. Uh, autonomous vehicles. I mean, we talk about this a lot, but we still don't quite understand how this will take place and uh, between a, an autonomous vehicle and other road users and many other things that have to do with, uh, with sight, with smell, with uh, intonation in talk, prosody and, and, and so on. Will agents, whether they're humans or machines, play along with interrogation, tacit inter interrogation? So if I say, I want to find out whether this is a machine or not, and I start asking, prodding questions, you know, and there's a human on the other end or as a machine on the other end, how will, how will the response be to my prodding? What will be the effects of incorrect determination on the interaction? Okay, will we be offended if we find out after talking to someone for 10 minutes that it's really a machine and we thought it wasn't? Um, you know, you all, you're familiar with the story of Eliza and Weizenbaum's, I think it was his administrative assistant secretary, he came back uh, late at night to pick something up from his office uh, after he built this uh, amazingly insightful ELISA uh, system which was kind of empty, devoid of intelligence, but gave the impression of, uh, of being able to carry out a, a, you know, a, a psychotherapy a session, short session. And, uh, and he came to his office, this the story goes, uh, and she was sitting there in front of the machine and crying tears. Uh, and suppose he said to her, what are you doing when this is just a stupid machine? Will she be offended? Will she be angry? Uh, and so on the other way around. You're talking to something, you're sure it's a machine. It talks like a bot, it answers like a bot. And suddenly the guy says, yeah, it's, <laughs> you know, I'm your next door neighbor. So what, how, will, how will we respond to that? And will, I, I mentioned this a, a, a few minutes ago, will we sometimes prefer not to know whether it's a human or machine? There are cases I can think of in training and in research where you're trying to uh, do something and figure out people's responses and you don't want the person to know whether it's a human or machine. So if it's very easy to tell, then these kinds of uh, operations will, uh, <coughs> will not work. And of course, this entire issue might just be something that, you know, we've been thinking about things and we wrote a paper and maybe people will read it, but in a few years it might all become a non-issue, maybe because of social norms coupled with the rigid regulation, for example, regulation says you have to say up front whether you're a machine or an agent, and some, some of these issues will go away, and of course ethical issues. And maybe simply due to the sweeping advantages of future machines, where well, this will become a non-issue because you know, we will really not be able to discern and the power of machines will be so great that this whole issue of whether it's a machine or not will disappear. I don't know. But we do believe that serious exploration right now of these issues, thinking about them, working on them, can uh, eventually contribute to uh, development methods for <coughs> computerized systems, which I think is of more interest to this audience than some of the other things uh, rel relative to this. And it could also, I think, improve our understanding of human behavior in general. So again, the issue is we're talking to or interacting with a machine or interacting with a human What's going on here? How do we respond? How do we respond to their response? Do we want to know? Do we want not want to know? Do we become offended or angry when we discover things and so on? And we think these are questions that should, um, should definitely be uh, uh, thought about, pondered. Um, and I want to move now to, to the second paper, which is a specific piece of work. And this does propose a methodology, an initial uh, um, kind of raw, <laughs> first cut methodology for employing uh, a computerized agent, a machine agent, in developing a system. Uh, so here I'm not asking for you to, uh, to not expect results and things that we've done. We've done stuff, but it's very preliminary. And I do hope the internet here works. I've connected it to my telephone because this password they gave me at the desk, I wasn't able to, uh, it didn't work for me. To, Ten times. So this is a second paper, also with Asaf Maron, but also with uh, Guy Katz, who uh, was my uh, PhD student many years ago, now at the Hebrew University, and Smadar Sekedi, so this doesn't point, of course, to the lead screen uh, uh, of my group. And this will appear in the Models World uh, 2024. Augmenting scenario-based modeling with generative AI. 
So can generative AI, for example, chat GPT, help in modeling complex systems? So the challenge is to leverage modern chatbots to reduce the workload of a software engineer or a programmer while ensuring robust and precise models. Now, I know, don't, don't jump up. You know, I know that we don't know how to tell chat GPT to write a correct program, a non-trivial program, but ensuring robust and precise models. <coughs> And the proposal here is to use ChatGPT in a controlled way, interactively. So we're talking again about interactions with AI, repeatedly invoking it to particular tasks while validating the outcomes rigorously and incrementally. So a kind of assistant. Um, and I, I do have to spend a couple of minutes telling you about scenario-based programming, those who do not know about it. It's a, it's not a new approach, it's been around for uh, now over 20 years, uh, not based on states, uh, based on scenarios, multimodal scenarios. So scenario-based modeling, the origins uh, down here are in a, a 1999 paper with Werner Damm and uh, later work with uh, uh, Rami Marelli in uh, 2003, his, his PhD thesis in a book that we wrote. Uh, but there's a lot of stuff about it. So the idea is uh, to develop a program or a system in a very intuitive way, incrementally, and, and highly aligned with the original requirements. So essentially one of the dreams is to take a requirements document if it's well written, and that is really your executable. You just have to formalize the scenarios. You know, Don't do that unless this, do this, followed by that. If the red light turns on, the lever is pulled down, and temperature is below 30 degrees, then the following happens unless three seconds have elapsed since. So this is what I just said now is a verbal requirement, and we, these requirements are really part of the program. Uh, we also have, uh, uh, we had um, uh, one of the PhD theses, uh, theses in, in my group was uh, a natural language interface to this approach. So you can really type or say what I just said now, and you get an execute. But it, it, the more important thing here is that the behavior is based on scenarios. And it's based on scenarios that are allowed, that are mandatory, which is what most programming languages are all about. You know, set x to y plus 1. You, you just do that when you get there. But also forbidden scenarios. So I can say, uh, I would, I never, uh, you know, the, the plane will never go below 100 feet if the, uh, the wheels are not, uh, you know, the wheel, what's it called, the uh, undercarriage, it, what's it called? Landing gear. The landing gear is not uh, open. And you say, you know, how do you know? How? So, but this is not something you verify the system against. It's something that you put into the program. I don't want to get into how this is done and how the machine operates. but, but. And the, the system can be executed as is. And just as a hint, forbidden scenarios, you, so it's, it's, a little bit like, um, it's a little bit like the following. Suppose... Suppose I describe someone here in the audience as living with a bunch of books of rules that regulate, say, can I use you as an example, regulate your life. I don't know where you're from, or, but let's say you have a book of, uh, you say you live in London and in, in Wembley. So you have the book of the rules of the Wembley district and the book of London. You have the laws of the United Kingdom. And then you have some other things that, uh, you know, maybe you're a, postdoc, so you have the rules, of, you, know, you have to give in your thesis before. And so these are all the rules. Some of these things are things you have to do, some of the things are things you may never do, and so on. And suppose I'm a person, uh, I'm your supervisor, say, and, and I say, lift up your right arm. And the question is, will you do that? And suppose, you know, you're, you, you have to defer to me because I'm your supervisor. And the answer is, you will do that, but not before you check through all these books to make sure it's not in opposition to anything else, you know, maybe on a, what's today, Monday, maybe on a Monday morning, if you have not had breakfast, you're not allowed to lift up. So you say, I'm sorry, sir, I can't do this. But suppose you, do, then you lift up your arm. And then before I give another instruction or another request, you say, hang on just one more second. You go through all the books to make sure that it's not something that is uh, 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 an outcome of that. So maybe there's a rule that says, if your right hand is up, you also have to lift up your left leg, you know. And so, so this is how we all live our lives. If we're, you know, obedient, uh, reasonable human beings, we do what we have to do. We do not do what we're not allowed to do. And all the other, we toss a coin or we use intuition or heuristics or whatever. And that's how the execution mechanism for these programming languages, the scenario-based ones, operate. They do what they have to do. 
they, if something is forbidden, they stop, they say impossible, maybe they backtrack and try a different path, depending on the mechanism. So these, are, these languages are executable, and they, the specifications, essentially the requirements, can be played out as is. And in principle, everything about verification is in principle. They are formal, so they are amenable to, to verification, repair, synthesis, and, and so on. So here's an example in a particular version of uh, scenario-based uh, modeling. I won't go into all the details. In any case, I can't point to the screen because it doesn't, it's, not, it's in, impointable. Um, so here we have, say, a hot and cold water tap, and we have uh, 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 the ability to add hot water, to add cold water, and we say five times add the hot water, so what you get is five times adding hot water. But if we add another scenario that, uh, following it that says add cold water five times, so this is what will happen. But if we want to enforce uh, um, uh, alternation between those, we simply say, um, wait for add hot, and at the same time block add cold. So when hot goes on, cold may not, and, and so for the same for the other side, and the execution mechanism will, will do what you want it to do, namely it will uh, uh, have this uh, alternation. The semantics, very, very briefly, is as follows. All scenarios execute in parallel, lockstep, synchronized manner, and you wait for um, uh, uh, an event. And each scenario says which events it wants, it requests, which events it blocks, it forbids, and which are those that they wait for, and if they come, they will do something, but they don't necessarily ask for it or forbid it. And so, now look on the right-hand side, scenarios go through this sieve, you have the requested ones in blue, the blocked ones in red, and then the next thing that happens is an event some event at random that is requested uh, but is not blocked by anyone is chosen. And that event is triggered in zero time and the event occurs uh, and then all the re scenarios that requested that event move forward, the ones that waited for that event move forward uh, and they update their declarations and you go back. Uh, so this very, very briefly, the most superficial way, this is how it works. And there are versions, there is a visual version called live sequence charts, there's a C++ version, a Java version, uh, and so on. You can read a lot about this. And the result is cohesive overall system behavior. Now how do we integrate large language models into the, how do we propose to integrate into the software development cycle? So. I think most of us know that uh, large language models are used widely to generate code, but we don't know really if the generated code is safe, reliable for critical applications. At the, me at the very least, we have to you know, go, go through it and, and verify it. And we propose a methodology that can produce a robust output structured with validation, accountability, and auditability at every step. Of course, the human is in the loop. So think of this as being following the previous part of the talk, we're talking again about interacting with AI, different kind of interaction. And the classical, this is a little bit of a superficial slide, but just to get the feeling, classical modeling life cycle, you specify the requirements, you model, you test and validate, or verify, you enhance, and then you go back until you're, you're happy. And what we're saying now is that the modeling consists of two parts. Chat GPT output scenarios, and then you use Chat GPT to generate test cases, and then you go to the testing. And the testing you do within Chat GPT, and then you do it independently. And I'll, I'll try to give you some examples. You revise the prompts, and you go back. And what happens at the beginning is, first of all, at some point you have to introduce the programming technique. So in this case, we, we had to tell Chat GPT what scenario based programming was, more or less the way I described it to you a little bit more carefully. Uh, maybe with a couple of examples, uh, and then you say, okay, now I'd like you to try to come up with the following, uh, with the responses for the following scenarios, and then, and then we, go through, we go through this loop. Now, <coughs> just to put, to put some flesh onto this, onto this uh, 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 modeling life cycle. So, introducing scenario-based programming to chat GPT, we instruct it to display, what we did is we instructed it to display the outputs as little transition systems, you know, the scenario that it produces, uh, marking states with the requested and blocked events. Then incrementally, we describe to it the scenarios that we want it to carry out, and in response, ChatGPT comes up with actual scenarios. 
We instructed to generate test cases and assertions to verify this, that we can apply formal verification tools to. Uh, and we have to take special care to make sure that the chat GPT knows about the domain uh, knowledge that, that we, we, we want. So, you know, hot water, cold water, taps, has to know something about those things. Um, and then we carry out initial testing and validation within chat GPT. I think I have a little example of this. And we challenge it to find gaps. And sometimes we say, hey, you made a mistake here. And it says, oh, I'm so sorry. And uh, here's a better uh, uh, attempt. Uh, and then we can carry out uh, independent testing, maybe even formal verification, um, and we can check. Uh, we can check. We can check ChatGPT's output using the best known methods that we have at our disposal: code review, unit testing, model checking, and so on. And if there's an error, we either revise the prompt and go back to step number five to carry out the testing, or we we uh, revise the requirements and go back to step number two. And this is something that you carry out. It's like an assistant. It has its own strengths, as we know from large language models. <coughs> it has its obvious weaknesses. Um, uh, and, and, and so here's a chat snippet. We say, consider the events water low ad hoc. Please suggest scenarios that wait. By the way, all the things on the slides here, and, and if I can connect to the internet, I'll show you actual uh, uh, recordings of uh, are exactly the way they were done. Uh, wait for water low and then add three times hot water. <coughs> Step two, iteratively describe one or more scenarios for the new requirements of the system. And ChatGPT says certainly and gives you these. Uh, I, I won't go through them, but it's, it's, it's pretty good. The scenarios are pretty good. Wait for water low, non-translation. Water low is triggered, go to status two. This is a transition system. And this is pseudo code that we made up from the code generated by the large. The capabilities are as follows. The, the large language model can create parts of the model and generate code. It can predict step-by-step -step execution. We can say, well, what will happen if we give it the following inputs and it will carry. Uh, I'm, I'm sure many of you have tried the, these kinds of things out on, on conventional programming languages, but here it's a little more uh, useful. Uh, we can ask it to generate an event log for executing models later on. Uh, we can ask it to reason together with it to reason about the model's execution. You know, so why did this happen here, and, and so on. Um, and, and now I have I have some examples. I will I have about six, but I won't have time for them. So I'll try to click um, uh, and just give you a feeling for the kinds of things that we did. We did more complicated things too, but you know, for this talk, um, let's see now if. Uh, Great. So uh, this is simply on the internet. I'm not doing it live right now. So anonymous is us. Please list reasons why a well-programmed autonomous vehicle might enter an intersection when the traffic light is red. These are the kinds of things that we're testing its knowledge. This has nothing to do with the programming. And chat GPT says, oh, lots of ways to do that. Emergency vehicle override, traffic officers, instructions, blah, 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 avoiding accidents, and so on. So, and then it adds, important to note that these scenarios depend on the autonomous vehicle's programming and the legal framework in the region of operation, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So that's like a little appetizer. Now, here's another example of a, a real chat. So we say scenarios P1 and P2 start together. There is an external time tick every second. After every three seconds, P1 requests event one, E1. After five seconds, processor two, P2 requests event two. A new requirement came in that E1 and E2 should not be triggered in the same second. Does this program, does this program comply with the new requirement? So again, apologies for this very, very simple uh, example, but it's an example of you know, whether we want to figure out uh, if something can happen uh, happens every uh, uh, three seconds, every five seconds, can they happen together? Chat GPT says to determine if the program applies with a new requirement, E1 and E2 should not be triggered in the same second. We need to analyze the timing of each event, you know, so it kind of goes on and on, as we know. Um, let's model the scenarios P1 and P2 in their states and transitions. So it itself, it builds the scenario for processor number one, wait for three seconds, after three seconds, go to state two, request E1, blah, 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 block E2 and then go back to state one, and, and dually for, for P2. And then it says the time pattern for each scenario is as follows. 
P1 does E1 every three seconds, P2 does E2 every five seconds. The overlapping needs to be examined. Let's look at the multiples of three and five to find common points. And then it shows the multiples of three, multiples of four. As we can see, both scenarios request their respective events at 15 second and 30 second marks. This means that E1 and E2 would both be requested at these times, violating the new requirement that they should not be triggered in the same second. Therefore, this program does not <coughs> comply with the new... This is all <coughs> ChatGPT's words, untouched. Uh, to comply, the scenario would need to be adjusted so that the requests never coincide in the same second. So we say, what if the numbers were 3,000 and 5,000 instead of 3 and 5? Would this fix the problem? And to assess what the change is, let's examine the timing of each event. The new scenario has now become blah, scenario P2 blah, and then it says we need to check the overlapping timers. Here are the multiples again. Look at these sequences. We again find common multiples, specifically 15,000 and 30,000, blah, blah, blah. So even if the intervals change to 30,000 and uh, um, to 3,000, 5,000 seconds, the program still does not comply, blah, blah, blah. So we said, what if the numbers were 79 and 97? To determine if the changing intervals, it goes to the same, all the same thing again. Let's calculate. And then it says, let's calculate the least common multiple of 79 and 97. These numbers are both prime, which means the LCM will be the product, and so the product is um, uh, 7,663. This means that the first time both uh, uh, events will be requested at the same time would be 7,663 seconds. Given that the intervals are significantly less than this LCM, <laughs> it is guaranteed that the unit will not be triggered with the range defined by these intervals. Therefore, the intervals, blah, 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 comply with the requirement. So then we say, you are correct, since the least common multiple, uh, I don't remember what went on here. Uh, and then we say, no, 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 the program is supposed to run for hours. And then ChatGPT says, given that the program runs for hours and the intervals, this is reflecting on my screen, and the intervals, um, no, no, it's, it's fine, it's just my, this is my screen. Um, given that the program runs for hours on the intervals for triggering events E1, E2, or 7097, we need to consider will they be ever triggered at the same time during extended operation. These are prime numbers, these common multiple, blah, blah, blah. This translates to 7,663 seconds, uh, according to 3,600 seconds an hour. Let's calculate, to find out many, how many hours. And then it says, uh, if you run this program for two hours, 0.13, blah, blah, blah. And then we ask, can you generalize this to any two numbers, n and m? Yes, we can generalize this approach, and it gives a general way of calculating the maximum time that this has to take uh, place in order for there to be a clash. Not very interesting, but I gave you this simple example to show you the kind of reasoning that we can coax it to carry out. Um, this thing maybe I will not show. Let's see which one it is. Um, this is about debugging. I want to show you something quite different. Yeah, so, so, so some, what, what is going on here, it's giving certain sequences of events according to a very simple uh, event selection mechanism. So in these scenario-based languages, remember I told you that you can select an event at random so the easiest thing is to take the first event that comes up in the listing of the program, uh, but there are other ways, random giving, giving um, a particular uh, uh, preference to, to uh, particular things. And at, at some point, and this is not for the technical part, I want, I want to show you that we asked ChatGPT if it's familiar with the concept of event selection strategy. And it says, yes, I'm familiar with the concept in the context of scenario-based modeling. This was after a relatively simple lesson about scenario-based modeling, where we said that the event can be selected using various mechanisms, and it found those mechanisms in other places. Um, so the event selection strategy, this is ChatGPT, is a critical component in determining how events are selected for triggering when multiple scenarios are active <coughs> and potentially request different events. In a scenario-based model, especially when using language or frameworks like live sequence charts or behavioral modeling, which is another term we gave to particular versions of this approach. Scenarios can request, wait, or block, for, block events. However, when multiple scenarios are them, the event selection strategy is the mechanism that decides which event 
gets triggered next. This strategy can be based on various criteria, and it does a wonderful job in giving all kinds of possibilities. Priority-based selection, random selection, round-robin or fair selection, condition-based selection. Again, in the terminology of, of modern computer science, these are simplistic things, but there are things that ChatGPT was able to come up with. And then we can go on and we actually do this and say, well, what happens in this particular example we gave you if instead of random you go through a round-robin mechanism and it carries this out and, and, and so on. There's one example here where it made a mistake. I hope I can find it. My time is coming to an end. Um, it was able to uh, create a specification for quicksort. See if we can see this easily. So we explained what quicksort is. This is first. Thing, this is the way we explain scenario-based programming, um, and then. Um, Okay, after explaining what scenario-based program is, we said, can you execute the following scenario-based specification of bubble sort, subject to the above semantics? And the semantics we gave was a particular event selection mechanism. Assume you have a row of cells, and then we explain, um, uh, uh, we have this robot, and it goes through the cells, and it does bubble sorting. Move left, move right, swap, check pair, and so on. Here are a few scenarios to start with. Repeat forever, wait for start, and move right, request check, and so on. And chat GPT does a very nice job. To start the execution of the bubble sort scenario-based specification, we need to initialize the program and define the initial state. Initializes the program, uh, starts carrying out. Uh, let's move to the first synchronization port, and you can actually follow the execution of, uh, of these scenarios. Later on, I'm not sure I'll have the time to explain this, um, there's, a first, there's a, an error in its table. Um, and it says, you're correct, and I apologize for the oversight. Let's correct the initial table after. I'm not quite sure why it made that error, but it's a simple error that you can figure out, you can see immediately. Uh, you said it should n never touch this cell if it hasn't touched that cell, and it did. I apologize, correct itself, and it will probably never repeat that error again, hopefully, that kind of error. And then later on, um, <coughs> so making some corrections. I think I, I think I won't go through the rest of this example. Uh, there's not enough time for that, and it, it will appear in the paper, in the appendix to the paper. Um, so here, I think this is one more thing I'd like to show. So scenario P1, this is what we say to it, requests event number one in a loop and blocks nothing. Scenario P2 requests event Number two in the loop and blocks nothing. Can you give me one example of the first six entries in a possible event log? And it says, certainly, and it gives the scenarios, and then it gives uh, this list. So the first thing that happens, E1 occurs, P1 requested E1, and it's not blocked, so it occurs. P2 requested E2, and it's not blocked, so it occurs. Then E1, so we have E1, E2, E1, E2, E1, E2. In this example, the events E1 and E2 alternate, but other sequences are also possible. This is chat GPT. And then we say, can you give some examples where it's not an, uh, an alternation? Certainly, given the scenario P1, and it gives another one, E1, E2, E1, E2, E1, E2, alternating, and consecutive E1s followed by E2s, E1, 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 E2, 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 and some more. Random, majority. Each of these examples represents a valid sequence, given the conditions on the scenarios, neither blocks, blah, blah, blah. And then we ask, are you familiar with the concept of event selection strategy? We've seen that earlier, it says yes. <coughs> and then we say, can you list three examples of six event entries and tie them to event selection policies? And this is interesting because it gives you a sense, it says, I did this at random, I did this using round robin, I did this using uh, priority. I'll, I'll skip this. Too much for one, one half of a, of a talk. Um, I want to mention a paper that uh, we wrote, again, with uh, Guy Katz and Asaf Mahon in 2018. Uh, I would humbly recommend it. Is that the right term? Uh, uh, British understatement. Uh, IEEE computer. Um, and in particular, it's called wise computing. 
In particular, there is a demo there that's recorded. Uh, someone told me there was a problem downloading the demo from my website. If you have a problem, just send me an email. I'll find a different way uh, to, to, uh, to get this uh, accessible. And this is, again, a philosophical paper um, in which we talked in general. This was before ChatGPT, uh, before the ChatGPT world and the world of large language models, uh, where the vision or the dream was to make the computer that you're developing your system on, on which you're developing your, your system, to be a real active member of the software engineering team, raising questions. You know, the team goes home at 5 p.m., the computer keeps on working, 9 a.m. in the morning, you come back, it says, you know, I was going through all these things during that, I was doing model checking on my own. I figured out that these two things can contradict each other in a particular case. Maybe you should change this. I also figured out that this piece of the software is redundant because it's covered by this other piece. Nothing of this is far-fetched. And, but it's more far-fetched for human beings to keep their minds. Uh, so so this, this, was, this was the vision, raising questions, making suggestions, carrying out verification-like processes, even without being explicitly asked to, to do so. And what I'd like to say about this paper, at least the examples I gave are very small, very modest, uh, almost obvious. Um, it's, it's a nice, cool step towards this vision, and I think I think that if uh, this approach of not relying on a large language model like ChatGPT to do your programming for you and then taking it and saying, you know, this works or this doesn't work, verifying it, but simply working with it patiently. So we were talking earlier about emotions, about stupidity. You know, you really have to have patience with the fact that every time you do something, it says, yes, now I'm going to show you because repeating. Uh, it's wisdom about event selection mechanisms again and again and again. Have patience, but if you work with it, you can coax stuff out of it, even in these simple uh, examples. And we have hopes that this methodology will, uh, will provide a platform for doing much larger and, and, and better things. And I just want to say, uh, in closing, uh, what I see common, it wasn't just that I have these two nice papers and I wanted to tell you about both of them, because, you know, I get this wonderful opportunity to give a keynote at VMKI. Uh, but there, is, there, is, there, is a, there, are, there are things that are common about this. And some of the common research themes are multi-step interaction. It's a constructive process. It generates a world of identities, relations, and boundaries that are often <coughs> absent from even the most rigorous definitions. And multi-step interaction is beneficial even when motives of parties or the equality of the contributions are unclear. So it's obvious that a programmer and a chat GPT bot have completely different uh, stakes in, in writing these programs and making them correct, and different motivations and different talents. But with a little bit of patience and coaxing, good things can come out of this interaction. And trust. So trust, the, the existence or absence of trust uh, is, affects the flow of, of, of the interaction very, very uh, uh, profoundly. And it calls for techniques for generating value even when the motives of quality are in question. And I think it also calls for human-computer interaction techniques for trust building. So the summary of this whole thing is that the <coughs> HOM, human or machine issue, uh, I think will become more and more central in human agent interactions. And combining modular iterative restatement of requirements, testing and verification with imperfect large language model co-generation can accelerate development of robust systems. Trust and multi-step interaction emerge as important meta-concepts, we believe, in human-computer interactions. Still lots of work to be done, and thanks for inviting me, and, and thanks for listening. Thank you for those two lovely talks, David. The, um, I should get paid twice, right? <laughs> the idea of using logic in some form to train artificial intelligence is, is a great one. I'm glad to see you talking about it. Many other people have talked about it as well. I think it's a great way forward. Um, one aspect of what you were talking about you didn't cover, which is going from chat GP to the logical formalism and going from logical formalism back to chat GPT, is, 
is it completely obvious? Do you just does it just do English pseudo uh, code that you translate, or how does that work? Well, you know, although I was trained as a logician, I'm not quite sure I understand what you mean when you say logic. But for example, in some of these interactions, it produced uh, transition systems. That's formal enough. Uh, we can take those and feed them back to JetGPT the following day, uh, and say, here are some scenarios. Um, you know, swallow them, give me some answers to the following you've got questions. A formal language, your scenario based programming thing. Yeah. And then you've got what ChatGPT does. Yes. And do you just paraphrase? Ah, okay. And now I understand. Yeah, we, yeah, yeah, what we do at this stage of this very preliminary research, yeah, we take the transition system, we paraphrase it as, as scenarios, and then if, if we like it, we add it to the system. No problem. So another step would be to give it the syntax of a particular version of scenario-based program and ask it to produce. That's not a big problem at all. I don't think it's a big problem. So it's a technical issue. Right. With regard to what you were saying about philosophy, right, it used to be that um, AI was like philosophy, right? If you didn't know what it was, it was AI. Right? Yeah. If you didn't know what it was, it was philosophy, and then when you knew it, it became science. Yes. And similarly, lots of the things that used to be AI, we now call logic and verification. Yeah, you know, I'm not, maybe not the <coughs> oldest person in the room, maybe I am, but um, decades ago, I used to go to, you know, Popple and Fox and stock conferences and talk about something. There was always someone who came up to me and said, Did, have you already done this using AI? You know, and so there was this kind of aura around the term. And even now, I mean, uh, you know, if, if you write a proposal and it has deep learning or LLM or chat GPT or even AI in its title, it gives it an extra 15% chance of getting funded. I'm exaggerating, of course. But there's something people are seeking in funding agencies and university funding uh, bodies. And I don't like that at all. Uh, and I think, I think, so one of the things I fight against is the overuse, the overhyping of buzzwords. Okay, that, that's, that's a term for you. Do not overhype buzzwords. Doesn't mean to say that a buzzword doesn't have substance to it, but put it in. You know, I have to, as as uh, my role in the Israel Academy, I keep having to fight government agencies. All they want is to have an institute for AI. An institute for, they don't care about anything else. You know, cyber AI learning. <laughs> what about climate? What about health? What about humanities? What about social sciences? You know, it's an uphill battle the whole time. Because they learn about these buzzwords, they don't learn. They hear about these buzzwords. They know a few things about them, and that's it. Yes, I wonder if anybody here has had a project on abstract interpretation funded because it abbreviates to AI. <laughs> yeah, that's what you said. Uh, yeah. uh, thanks uh, uh, again for for the wonderful talks. And I, I had a question about scenario-based modeling. I think that's what makes actually this interaction so successful, that you have this nice high-level model. The, the way you described it, it, it looked like gear towards safety properties, right? And so when you mentioned the, uh, the airplane with landing gear, I was wondering, well, you know, airplane, unlike helicopter or drone, cannot just stop in place. So it, uh, did, did you uh, explore uh, how, how this um, modeling paradigm works when things just keep happening and when you cannot stop the world, so to say? That's a, that's a great question. It's a great question. There was a research project I once tried to start, uh, which even without scenario-based program, which uh, which goes like this. You know, you have a very critical piece of software that you've written and it works nicely. You know, some some something is up in space and it's working, and you have to change not a parameter, but you have to change part of the behavior, part of the code. So even deciding which parts of the code can be pulled out and reinsert it differently to keep up the behavior of the program, these things are either undecidable or very hard to, to decide. And, and even if you are much more modest and you say there are just three things I want this device to keep on doing. It has to keep on moving, has to keep on moving at uh, the same velocity and so on. All the other stuff I don't care about. Now I want to pull a piece out. And so this, this is the same kind of question. Uh, these are, these are hard, hard problems, and they go into computability and complexity theory. It's not just a question of finding a methodology, and therefore I'm, I'm being modest when I'm saying that your question is not just about scenario-based modeling, which is a nice way to program because you have the scenarios ready made. Pull out the scenario, put another one in. You can pull out a piece of, uh, you know, piece of assembly language if you want, or, or Pascal or C++. Same issue occurs. That's a, it's a, it's a, I think it's a hard and 
deep issue about system development. When can you make changes without disrupting parts of the behavior? And is that even decidable when you can do that? Thank you. So about the first part, um, the HRM question, did you consider it from the perspective of <coughs> a poor machine who does not know whether it's talking to a machine or a human? I think we cover that also, but not, it's not, it's not I mean, <coughs> the people who program the machines. Um, m most of the issues come up there too, but of course we concentrate in our ruminations on, on human beings interacting with them. But, uh, but so many of the yeah, issues... I was are, wondering whether there are interesting questions at all. I'm sure there are. Uh, over and above the ones that we asked, yeah. So this is the kind of response we want to get from this paper. Pe people thinking, for example, about the point of view of the stupid machine over there and the people who program it. And let me, can I have 30 seconds more? So, uh, you know, scientists who do lots of different things, there's a big disadvantage in that. You know, you spread your butter very thin. This is my profile for 50 years. But uh, the advantage is you, you're like a child and you get to like to talk about your latest toy. So my latest toy, uh, together with a lot of other things like this, is I've been working for three years with a group of seven or eight people in, in my team on prosody, which is the music of speech. And so your question and my answers and your <coughs> extension could be easily recorded and transcribed, or maybe even by hand. And we give it to someone outside, they read it, they more or less understand what transpired between us. Uh, or for that matter, what transpired in this room for the last hour. But there's so much more, even in this, what I just said, there's so much more in the way we, we play the music in our speech. But, and I won't have time to give examples. It's not just where you put the emphasis, whether it's a question. It's a multi-layered thing. I can say something which is both a question and it's sarcastic and it's asked out of fear. And you, as an intelligent human being, will immediately say, that's a question, he's afraid, and he's asking it sarcastically. And no one has any idea how this can be extracted from the recording of speech. And people say to me, well, some things are very easy, like a question. It always goes up at the end. And I say, no, you take a 15-year-old teenage girl, or boy maybe for that matter, everything they say ends like that. No matter what they're talking about, that's the way they end the sentence. So even that is not simple a thing. It's a, it's a difficult question. It has numerous applications, numerous applications, including chat GPT. You know, if we could not only talk to it and it answers in a bot-like style, but, but it understands our intentions, it understands where I'm, when I'm hesitating, when I'm you know, jeering at it for being stupid, when I really want an answer, whether I'm asking. And, and, and the, the synthesis of the speech will also be um, uh, ingrained with, with prosodic... Uh, it's, it's a difficult problem and it's, it's a wonderful area of research. Uh, we're finishing our first paper on this uh, you know, as we speak. Uh, and this is something that's also relevant. In fact, in one of my conversations with ChatGPT, I said to at the end, if, if you are your developer, what extensions would you like you to add to you? To you? I, I didn't ask it in that confusing way. And it said certain things. Uh, and then I said, but what about speech? And it said, yeah, it would be nice if you could talk to me. And I, I think there are ways now you could do that. And then I said, but in, in speech, there's a lot more to what I tell you and what you tell me beyond the words. And it said yes. And I said, do you know what prosody is? And it said yes. And I said, would it be nice for you to understand the prosody? And he said, yeah, it would be great. So <laughs> it's, it's telling me that uh, we're, we're working on something that even it would, uh, would like to have. So thanks a lot. Thank you.